Before I start the sermon, I want to uh, back up what Brian said. Thank you so much for your giving this year and the way you support the mission of the church. I also want to tell you that tonight, Christmas Eve service, we will be taking an offering for local missions. And so it's not going to be a typical tithes and offering uh, service, we'll be going straight to local missions. And we are starting some new things in the next year that we're very, very excited about, uh, including trying to imagine how to retrace our church's roots back into the city of Baltimore. And so if you were interested in giving to that, uh, we would appreciate you planning and donating to that. In, in fact, if you're not coming tonight and you would like to give to local missions, we will have someone with an offering bucket on the way out. And that won't go to tithes and offerings, that'll go to local missions. And so if you're not coming back tonight and you'd like to give to that, we would appreciate that as well as we uh, imagine what God is leading us to in the next year. Again, thank you so much. So we're closing out our Advent series uh, today. Today is the last Sunday of Advent, the fourth Sunday of Advent. I saw a meme this week that cracked me up with the Grinch on it that said uh, this year he was trying to steal the last week of Advent from us. That's a little funny. Uh, so today is the fourth Sunday of Advent, but it's also, of course, Christmas Eve. And so, um, so we're going to finish up talking about already and not yet, or, or the fourth Sunday of Advent this morning, and then we'll have a Christmas service tonight. We do want to see you back here tonight. Five to seven will be a completely different service with different musicians and different songs and different preaching, the whole deal. Kids will be with us, which is always exciting and fun. And uh, I always promise to end that service within an hour. I don't promise that on Sunday morning. So... Within an hour on, on Christmas Eve night. So we hope we'll see you there. So I wanted to show you some houses before we started. I, I do like checking out Zillow um, for houses that I'll never be able to afford. Do any of you like that? Yeah, okay, all right. At least we're on the same page. And so I was wondering, uh, would any of you be willing to live in this house? Yeah. That to me... That to me looks like if you wanted to live at a theme park, like, you, like the feeling of adventure that you get going over the roller coaster, if that's what you want your bedroom to feel like. Yeah, I don't know about that. Uh, what about this? Would you like to live in this house? Do you know whose house that is? Tony Stark's house. That's right. Tony Stark, Iron Man. Um, now, that's a pretty cool looking house, but I got to tell you that... When I saw this house for the first time in Iron Man, I thought back to my geology class in college. I had to take a science class. Everyone had to take a science class in order to graduate uh, the school I went to. And so I waited and I waited and I waited and I was a senior knee deep in theology and church history and my advisor said, hey, you're not getting out of here without a science class. And so I was like, yeah, I better do that, huh? And so I went looking through all the science classes, and I heard horror stories about how uh, biology one and chemistry one went for actual majors who wanted to be in those. And so I kept looking, and I saw geology. I was like, huh, that doesn't sound like a fail you out of college class. I'll give that a try. And, and I ended up, I really enjoyed that class a lot, actually, much to my surprise and dismay. But the thing that I remember more than anything about that class is a whole lecture about real estate and why you should never buy a house like this from a geology professor. And his argument basically was, well, I, actually, I think I'll show you what his argument basically was. Check this video out. Houseboat, right? Now, you may or may not learn a lot about Jesus today, but you're definitely going to check your home insurance policy when you get home, aren't you? 
Well, the reason I'm showing these horrifying videos may come to light here in just one moment as we read our scripture today. We're going to look at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' most famous sermon in all of scripture. Uh, the last uh, seven or so verses of chapter 7 of Matthew. And I invite you, if you would, to stand with me as we honor the reading of the word of the Lord as we read Matthew 7, verses 24 to 29. These are the words of Jesus. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So this is the Sermon on the Mount, the last word of a three-chapter sermon in the Gospel of Matthew that Jesus teaches to us. And you may wonder to yourself, you may not wonder to yourself, you may not care, but you may wonder to yourself, why in the world... Is Jesus giving such an important sermon up the top of a mountain? Does he really need to make all those people climb after him up a literal mountain? There's no trams, no trolleys, no gators, no cars to get up there. People, the elderly, if they want to hear, up the mountain they go. What in the world is Jesus doing using such a venue to preach such an important sermon? I'd love to believe that many of you would chase me up a mountain to hear one of my sermons. I, I just have, I have my doubts. But then again, I'm not, I'm not Jesus, right? So why is Jesus up on a mountain? Well, I don't think the location of Jesus is near as important as the location of Moses, actually. I, I think Jesus is in the Gospel of Matthew, looking back at Moses and modeling Moses. This is early in Jesus's ministry, and people, as you know, love symbolism. And so Jesus is in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, the very Jewish Messiah. He is the embodiment of the law. And Moses received God's law up on a mountain. And so Jesus is re-narrating, re-speaking, re-teaching the heart of what God was showing Moses. Now, we have a very particular way of receiving laws, don't we? Oh, you may not think so, but um, next time you're driving down a freeway with no cars on it and you see a speed limit of 55... You should ask yourself, what should I do with this speed limit of 55? Look around at an empty road, no officers, no cars. Are you going to go 55? Or are you going to go 62 and say, well, even if a cop pops out, they're not going to get me? This is how we treat law. We look for loophole. We look for edges. We look for ways around. We, we are interested in the heart of the law. But often we look at the heart of the law as a way in order to get away with as much as we can possibly get away with. This is not what God was going for when he spoke to Moses on the side of the mountain. And of course, Moses comes down the mountain, and you may recall what he sees after receiving the law from God. The people have missed him for a little while, so they start making false idols out of gold. Moses' own brother is the goldsmith. Moses throws the tablets down. He's angry. He goes back up and needs more time with God to get himself straight so he can look these people in the eye again. Moses goes back down, presents the law, and Israel as a people, as a nation, as a new nation, is established under the Ten Commandments and the telling of the law. Now, this is in so many ways what Jesus is up to in walking back up the mountain. 
He's reminding the people of who God has called them to be. Not with the law specifically, but in embodiment or a fulfillment of the law. Jesus is becoming or showing himself to be the very word of God, the fulfillment of the law for the people. He's trying to teach them what the heart of God's desire for them is to be. And what he's trying to show more than absolutely anything is what a good life looks like. A good life, the way to live, the way to treat others, the way to be treated. He's trying to do what the law was meant to do in the first place, is to show that a separate way of living is possible and that it could be to the glory of God and it could be to the benefit of the people. And so what is it that Jesus talks about in this Sermon on the Mount before he gets to what we talked about today? Well, he talks about the blessings of mourning, of peacemaking, of meekness, of persecution. What now? He talks about judgment on anger and not just murder. Okay. He talks about loving your enemies and your neighbors alike. Okay. Well, all right, Jesus. He talks about prayer and what good prayer looks like. He talks a lot about economics. He talks about worry. And he says that not everyone who cries out to Jesus will make it into the kingdom of heaven. Okay, well, this maybe sounds like scary, difficult, hard news. I thought this was supposed to be good news, these gospels, Jesus. And it is, and it can be. Jesus is showing us that the way we think of common sense, of the way we should live. That person has wronged me, I will be angry, I will not be sad if they die. That's how we think. Is not a way that actually leads to a good life, a life of joy, a life of productivity, a, a, a life near to God. These things that we assume are just common sense, the way it ought to be. We look down on mourning, we look down on meekness, we look down on persecution. We look down on murder, but not angry, be angry, who cares, right? Jesus is showing these things that we just accept as normal destroy our lives and destroy our souls. He's teaching us that there's another way to live near to the heart of God that is better and different than the way we just accept as normal. More than anything, he's teaching us that the creator of life, God, he is the embodiment of God. The one who created life is teaching us what a good life is. And one thing that I think we can get out of the Sermon on the Mount as a whole, that maybe we could even begin to embody, is that if we learn to trust the way of Jesus, instead of looking at his sermon and say, whoa, that sounds awful hard, I don't know if that's for me, but I wonder if really living into what Jesus teaches us could be the best form of evangelism in an angry and divided and broken world. What if the church took Jesus' teaching so seriously that it embodied it at an individual and communal level and showed the world that Jesus' way is better than the common sense of the world that we live in? What if we put away economics of individual prosperity? What if we put away retaliatory anger? What if instead we embrace the way of Jesus? and showed that it did bring about good life, joy, prosperity, friendship, kindness, acceptance. What a way of an evangelism that would be for the people of Jesus to look different than the rest of the world. Well, think about, on the other hand, what the other articulation of the good life is. The world we live in would say a good life is health, money, Family, friends, a large house, a good job, lots of fun. You've heard this story before. You know this narrative. You know that this is the Sermon on the Mount that culture, that the world preaches. That if you have those things, you'll have a good life. If you have most of those things, you'll have a good life. And many of us have sold our soul to achieve these things. Because we've become convinced that this is the good life. And if you can get these things, and you can achieve them, and you can begin checking them off, that's great. 
But are any of them solid, rocky foundation? Or to borrow the teaching of Jesus this morning, are many of them built on shifting sand? Here's the thing. I don't look at any of those things. Not one of those things do I look at and say, that's bad. That's evil. That's wrong. Not at all. In fact, I think I could say with all honesty that for the most part, I wish every one of those things on each and every one of you. I see nothing inherently wrong with these things. But the problem is that circumstances so often dictates who gets and who doesn't get. And circumstance is a sandy foundation, one that offers very little support when the world begins to change. Each and every one of these things are lovely and wonderful gifts, but when the world goes wrong, each and every one of them can slip away from us in just and unjust manners. So what happens when illness comes? What happens when the economy goes bad? I'm, I'm not incredibly old, getting there. My daughters will tell me I'm old when I get home for lunch. So trust me, I'll get mine. But in my lifetime, we've had three recessions and I was born right after people were lined up 10 miles for gas in the 1970s, right? Like the economy has gone like this my entire life. I've seen people make it and then lose it within years of each other. What happens when the economy goes bad? What happens when drama enters the family? What happens when your friends get a new job opportunity and they move? Or your friends of your childhood drift away and you begin to feel alone looking for an entire new set of friends? What happens when housing becomes unsettled, either because of a market or a place you're renting from sells? What happens when we lose our job, maybe even of no fault of our own? What happens when depression hits or seasons change? Or we just get old and what used to be fun isn't fun to us anymore? Or what used to be fun we're incapable of doing anymore? What happens when something outside of our control begins to creep in onto the things that we have articulated are the way and the path to the good life? See, we have convinced ourselves as Americans that we're in control of all of the things in the left column. But the truth of the matter is, is some of the most self-respecting people with the most control and the most aptitude that I've ever known have fell victim to the issues on the right when everything was going swimmingly for them on the left. Circumstances change. And Jesus exposes to us in our text today that we often build our life on circumstances. And the problem with circumstances is that they will always be a foundation of sand. Circumstances will always be a foundation of sand. And if we're going to build a good life, and there are a lot of ways to build a good life, we've got to learn how to properly and correctly define what a good life is. We have to figure out and sort out what actually is firm and solid and eternal and strong ground that we can build our life on so that when circumstances of rain come, when circumstances of shifting ground come, when circumstances of earthquakes come, when circumstances well outside of our control hit all too close to home, we are unrattled. And this is what Jesus is trying to teach us in the Sermon on the Mount, is that all too often we're chasing after circumstances. And when circumstances align in our life, we will often give glory to God. But once just one of those circumstances change, we often then become whalers demanding God to show himself. 
Why would you let this happen to me? Is the question that we often ask. Jesus is teaching us that his way of life is a way to have a good life and a life that is not built on the shifting sands of circumstance. But one of the things that I think is really important as you dig through the Sermon on the Mount and come to this conclusion that he's given us today is that we've got to come face to face with the fact that Jesus is about more than just how to get to heaven. We have often reduced Jesus as just a formula to get us to heaven. And listen, I I don't want to negate that. Jesus will return. We will spend eternity with him in his glorious paradise. Don't hear me saying that that's not going to happen. But that's not the simple wholeness of the gospel. The wholeness of the gospel reaches to us now in this moment and helps us to build a foundation that isn't cracked or shifted or swayed by a world that's in chaos. We become more and more and more aware of a world in chaos throughout my lifetime, really. I was born in the early 1980s, and and right on the back of Vietnam, every war we've had cameras in. Like, that's a massive change in the history of the world. If there's a, a... If there's a tsunami in Japan, we get images of it immediately. Our great-great-grandparents didn't live in that world of knowing just how much chaos there was in the world. We are more aware of a world in chaos than anyone has ever been in the history of the world. It's easy for us to look around and see how much chaos there is. And that can create within us a sort of depression or sadness or despair But then we also assume it's never going to get to me. That's their problem on the other side of the world. And then when chaos does come home, we begin to ask, well, why didn't God protect me? What's difficult about this text, I think, is that Jesus assumes that bad things are going to hit you in your lifetime. Jesus doesn't say, listen, build a house where the storm never hits. Like, that's not what Jesus is teaching here. Jesus doesn't say, somewhere there's a life that you can build where difficulty will never find you. There will never be rains, there will never be landslides, there will be earthquakes. It will be easy to live there. No, Jesus assumes that when you're going to build a life, When you're going to build a house, you're going to have to build it in a place where difficulty will touch you. The storm will come. There will be a season in your life that is difficult, that is filled with conflict, that is harder than you want it to be, that's more than you can handle, and more than you deserve. That's the assumption of this story that Jesus is telling us. You will have hard things happen to you. God's job is not to build a bubble around your life to protect you from difficulty. We are talking about a Jesus who just 15 chapters from now is going to get nailed to a cross. This is the God that we serve, one who embodies suffering himself. Difficulty is going to happen. That is the measure of life. Difficulty. Jesus is teaching us to weather the storm, to build a life on foundations, on things that matter, things that can endure, things that that give us help and purpose and direction, that when difficulty comes, our house, our home, our life will not be rocked to the point of rubble, that but when difficulty hits us, we will be able to stand and stand strong and remain and endure. And Jesus is saying his teachings will give us the strength to endure difficult seasons. That the difficult season will pass, the storm will stop, and we will be able to look and say, Jesus taught me how to weather that storm. And the testimony on the other side will be beautiful and wonderful. And it may even instruct a friend or a neighbor how when their season of difficulty comes, they can endure through the hard times as well. 
Now, here's the thing. I, I, think, I think there's a way that you could have heard this sermon and say, okay, well, does Jesus not care about our circumstances? Like, man, I'm, I'm living in a tough time right now. And Jesus is talking about this meta thing about where to build your life and your house. And, and I, I'm not saying that at all. In fact, Jesus kind of says amen to this sermon and walks down the mountain into town. And the first thing he does is run into people with circumstances that are urgent this second, this moment, right now. He comes down the mountain and he meets people who needs healings. This is not a meta issue. He doesn't look at him and say, well, if you had built a better life on a nicer foundation, then you would have been okay. Pats them on the shoulder and walks on. No, he starts healing people immediately. He, he gives a sermon. He says, build your life on something sturdy. My teachings are sturdy and they will help you through the difficulties of life. But then when people come to him immediately with circumstances of now, of illness and death and disease of now, that matters to Jesus too. This is the incredible story of God is that he comes to us and teaches us the big picture. But he also cares about the struggle of today. Jesus cares about both. He's helping us for the long term, and he's helping us with the moment. Jesus truly cares about our circumstances. Now, as I close up today, the band starts coming out. Pastor Brian sent me a little video this week, and I didn't want to show you the whole video, but I took a still picture of it. Uh, this is from a fisherman who saw one of those houses from the early picture. That's a house just floating through the ocean that came off the, uh, the ground on, on shifting sand. And it's possible that you may feel like this today, that maybe you don't have a chance to build a foundation because your house has already been built on sandy foundation. It is now adrift at sea. But I have good news for you. Metaphors always break down. The metaphor that Jesus has given us is beautiful and wonderful. But of course, if your house is bobbing through the Atlantic Ocean, you can't just go and pick it up with your bare hands and put it on a rocky, solid foundation, of course, right? But the metaphor always breaks down. In Jesus' metaphor, we can actually lift this house, our life, out of the ocean and put it on rocky ground because the metaphor doesn't demand our natural strength to be a part of it. God is the one who lifts us up and picks us up and puts us on solid ground. And if you feel today your life is built on circumstances or your life is worse than that, it's a drift out in the ocean, it's not too late to say, I'm going to dig back into Jesus. I'm going to turn back to him. I'm going to ask him for help. I'm going to seek him to be the one who saves me from even chaotic environments. It's never too late with Jesus. And so as we sing this final song today, if you needed to return to Jesus or just ask Jesus for help or again say, Jesus, teach me how to build my life onto a solid foundation, now would be as good a time as ever, the day before we celebrate his birth, to say, be born again in me. The altars are open for prayer if you'd like it. If you need just a moment with Jesus to say, recalibrate me. Take me away from my life that demands circumstances all line up and be good. And give me a life built on the firm foundation of you. The band is going to come out and sing. I invite you to stand with me. If you need to pray, please come and use the altar and do so. Let's sing in praise as we close up today.